Like I remember that my first job here was I was a crew for a fast food company, right? I make like seven dollars something. It was nothing, right? I got paid the first pay I ever got in my entire whole life. I went to the bank, took out I think three hundred dollars of it. Mm-hmm. Yo, dude, I thought I was Lil Wayne, like making it rain, balling. You know, <laughs> I felt I'm not joking. I felt like I was the richest guy in the whole wide world, because that was the biggest amount of money that I ever held in my hand. Three hundred dollars, you know. Hey, Aaron. Thanks for being on the show. Hey, Daniel. Thank you for having me. Oh, it's my pleasure. Um, Aaron, last time we spoke. You told me a little bit about your story, uh, your life back in the Philippines, which is, I mean, quite different from the life that you live right now in Canada. Hmm. Um, because you said that you grew up in a, I mean, how do you say, it? like in a very poor family? Did yeah. you Did you know that you were poor, or that was just for you was just the norm? Oh, we know we're poor. <laughs> If it, when there are times that you don't have food to eat and you just have to go to bed, you know you're poor. <laughs> But was the same thing for other people, for your friends, or was just uh, your family was different? That's what I'm saying. Like, was that the norm because everybody was in the same situation, or yeah, you felt I, like you were different? Yeah, I mean, we, I live in a slum. You know, everyone's poor. You know, there are some people that are that are you know have, their life are better. You can tell. Mm-hmm. You know, some of my friends are way better than my social economic uh, situation. But pretty much everyone's poor, man. <laughs> And how would you describe your your child in uh, in the Philippines? Of course, the poverty sucks. It was it made it made it very hard and difficult, a lot of stress. However, that comes with freedom too, because you could just go to the fields, do whatever you want to do, play. You know, we used to go to, like I said, the fields. We you know make up random games. Uh, sometimes we go to the cemetery. In the Philippines, it's not like here that they bury people in the ground. Mm-hmm. We have like, I don't know the for, for the word for it. We call it nicho. So like, people will build like a, I don't know, like a triangle thing. Then they put the put the coffin inside. Mm-hmm. That's how it is. And some people they like stack them. Like they call it apartments. So the coffin will so, be above ground. Yeah, it's above ground, but it's like in a like a cement, like a cement. Mm-hmm. They'll put a hole in it, and they'll just put the coffin and then cover it up. Okay. So, so it's sealed, mm-hmm. but the coffin is in there, you know. And sometimes, you know, people, you know, in the family passes away, they'll stack them up because, of course, you have to pay for the ground. Mm-hmm. So it becomes like for us kids, they're like buildings. So sometimes we jump over over each other. You know what I mean? Like. It's it's insane. It's like we invented parkour before parkour. <laughs> <laughs> I think I was doing the, a similar thing, but with construction sites. We used to go inside of like a housing construction and we'd go underneath. And I mean, when people were not working after hour over the weekend, we'd just go in there and play mm-hmm. hide and seek, or we'd do just we felt like it was a cool thing to do. <laughs> just go in a construction site and explore the house when they were building it up. It was. Probably looking back was not the safest thing to do, but for us, which is the best. <laughs> You're a kid, you know, Thanks. you don't, you can't think. <laughs> but because I live in the um, small town, like really small town. Well, before it was a small town, now it's like close to a city. So it, there's not much really to do. There's no like big house constructions. And if there are, we probably steal something from it, you know. <laughs> Like the, no one really like leaves stuff because people will steal stuff. Mm-hmm. Like that's how, because, you know, again, I told you like poor place, you know, but yeah, it was it, over that. Other than that, it was a fun childhood. I mean, other than the poverty, that kind of sucks. Yeah. I mean, that that's what I was asking you that question. It was like, if you're like a, so aware that, the, that the, you were actually, you were poor. Or was that just the. Uh, the way people live. And if you can't eat, as you say, you mentioned this last time, that you were going to bed hungry. 
And mm. it was like, was your grandma, your grandpa, they would say like, I just drink a, water, uh, yeah, yeah. a glass of water and, and go to bed. Yeah. Like, so sometimes at night, you know, kids, you still get hungry, right? And you'll go, I'll, sometimes I'll go to my dad or my grandma. I'll be like, yo, ma, grandma, uh, I'm still hungry. And she'll be like, drink a glass of water and go to bed. They'll pass. <laughs> Did it work? But that, of course, you know, even now it's like fasting, you know, now it's a cool thing to do. That's our lives. Fasting was our lives, you know, but it is what it is, you know, like what are you going to do? Like kind of the old situation. Um, but you know, it's funny thing is like, I always knew good things will happen. Like now it's people are like manifestation. Mm -hmm. I didn't know about manifestation when I was young, you know, but I had like a feeling that someday this poverty will end. I don't know how, but this will end. Was this kind of coming from like your, your family, this kind of positive attitude or maybe it was part of the you know, religion or something that was, do you know what, like, what this like positivity mindset was coming from? I, to be honest, I never even thought of that, but... Was well, just you or I, somebody else in the family were thinking like, it oh, was this just is going to be good? It was just me because I remember talking to my sister about it. There were times that I questioned when I was young. I was like, I asked myself, like, is this going to end? This poverty is going to end sometimes, you know, when hard times are happening. But most of the time when I'm like happy and, you know, enjoying my life, I'm like... Someday this will gonna end. This poverty is gonna end, and I don't know how it's gonna end, but this will end. I just like positivity, religion, maybe a little bit of religion because I was raised Christian. As my grandma said, "Catholico sarado," it means like you're a Catholic mm -hmm. no matter what. You know, you know how Catholics are like you know redemption, right? Yeah, I'm one of them on paper. Yeah, yeah. exactly. You know, so I have that like positivity. I guess a little bit of that, but thinking on that more but it's just it's just me it was just like uh this is gonna end sooner or later this is gonna end i don't know how i don't know when but it's gonna end i mean it works out at the end i again manifestation i don't know you know it just happened um is manifestation something that you do regularly or that was just for that specific moment no i actually against manifestation a little bit i'm like manifestation like you, know, you can't just think and then that something happens you know mm -hmm. I remember when I was in elementary there was this teacher he, I was like half half on this guy because he was like manifestation he was actually the first one who mentioned about manifestation and but he is like a Jesus thing Jesus guy he's I think he's a boss was, or something sorry was this in Philippines or in Canada yeah this is in the Philippines okay and and he kept on telling like, oh, if something bad happened or you want to, something to happen, you just have to think, think positive, think positive. And like, yeah, yeah, okay, cool, whatever, you know. And then I remember one day I was coming home from, uh, I went to a video, video game shop. So in the Philippines, there's no arcades mm -hmm. or at least where I was from. People will have like, random people will have like uh, video games, like uh Nintendo 64, maybe like five of them. And then they'll invite kids to come in to play the video game, but you have to pay. Mm -hmm. Right. So one afternoon I went there and I was coming home and I didn't have money. I was like, man, sometimes I go to the video game place just to watch because I don't have money anyway. Excuse me. So sometimes I'll go. And so that day I was walking and I was like, man, I wish I had money. You know what? I'm going to find money. I'm going to find money. I'm going to find money. You know, dude, I found. 20 pesos in the ground. I was like, what the? I was like, what is this? In context, like, okay, what's so, 20 pesos? I'm sorry? In context, what's, what, what can you buy with 20 pesos? Or what's if the you're equivalent? poor, it's like a hundred million dollars. <laughs> but in, in like, in terms, like, what would you describe it? Like in, in terms, like a Canadian dollars or American dollar, what, what, how much would it be? With like 20 pesos, can you buy grocery? Or can bit. you buy, I don't know, no. I don't know, candies or? Yeah. Candies, you know, but again, like I said, if you're poor, 20 pesos is a million dollars. <laughs> I'm telling you right now. And I want to go back to like your family and your story back then, because you told me that your mom 
had to leave when you were like eight years old to move to mm-hmm. Hong Kong to find a, find a job and work a, abroad so that can, she could p- provide for the family. And I don't know if it's just like a, my Western culture, but usually it's the husband and the dad that usually provides for the family. Usually the mom stays home and take care of the kids, take care of the house. Why mm-hmm. was your mom leaving and not your dad? Here's the thing about the Philippines, which I love and kind of not love, is we're very matriarchal society. We, we are like the woman runs the house. Mm-hmm. So the man will be, as they say, like, quote unquote, the boss, but the woman runs the house more often than not. And sometimes the woman really runs everything. So she she has the the last say. However, going to back to the question is my mom left and why her is because back then the jobs that was being offered to people called OFW, which is overseas Filipino workers, are nannies or cleaning ladies, maids. Those are the easiest jobs to get. Those are what available to move to migrate. So my mom... I'm not sure actually if my dad tried, but it never worked out. He never left. But so my mom decided like, yo, we got to do something about this. I'm moving. I'm the one who's going to migrate because or else we're going to be poor forever. <laughs> I mean, one that's one thing I, I, I don't know. You, you didn't mention about my pocket, but with my pocket, it's, it's my ode to my mom because I talk about her all the time, like how her sacrifices and everything. And yeah, that's the reason to answer your question is because back then women are getting offered the job. That's why. And even now, actually, there was like, it's not an epidemic, but it's a normal thing that women from the Philippines goes to Italy to work. Mm -hmm. And as you know, like the the currency change from the Philippines and the European is like one, one is equal to, I think, 50 pesos. So these women that works in Italy makes so much money and saves them up and then sends them back to the Philippines. In the Philippines, these people have mansions. And I'm not exaggerating, mansions. Mm-hmm. But they don't live there. They're working in Italy. So it's just an, it became a normal thing. So in the Philippines, there's a lot of men that takes care of the kids. Takes care, quote unquote, takes care of the kids. And the woman will be an immigrant or a migrant. Okay, because I mentioned to you last time when we spoke that I had um, quite a few co-workers in New Zealand that were working with me. They were from the Philippines and they were mm. in kind of your mom's situation. So they left their family back home, back in the Philippines and they were like provided for the whole family. And they were like sending, I remember like this guy was just saving a bar of chocolates and was just sending a box of chocolate back to the Philippines for their kids and they were like loving it. That's why I was saying, like, it's for me, even because, as I said, maybe it might be the, the Western culture, like, as you say, I mean, your Philippines wasn't not much of a difference. Like, the, the man usually take, provides for the family and all that stuff. Um, mm. And also because I saw people in, in New Zealand doing the same thing. It was like usually the, 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 ma, the man, the husband, that will leave abroad. Even because I'm not a parent, you are, right? Um, mm-hmm. I think it would be hard for a mother leaving their kids than for a dad. Right. Yeah, it's extremely hard. But when you see your kids starving, yeah. you make a decision. No, no, fair enough. Fair enough. Right? And I'm not exaggerating, by the way, when I say starving, mm-hmm. I mean, it's starving. Yeah. I mean, your mom, like you say, was great. I mean, I have to give it so much credit because not just she moved abroad and was able to see you guys like every two years. You mentioned that was, she was coming back for a month every two years, like even just leaving a life like that, not being able to, to see your kids growing. I mean, it's hard for me not to see my nephew and my niece growing. I see them every year, every couple of years. Like, how can it be with a f- for a parent not mm-hmm. being there? So a lot of credit to your mom for that. And also the fact that wasn't just providing for you guys, then she managed to move the whole family to Canada. And as you mentioned, like- Badass. You, absolutely. Because as you mentioned, like people that work abroad, the currency exchange with the money they make, they can create a, a wealth or provide it for the family back in the Philippines. But mm-hmm. when 
you don't convert the money. So for you, she has to pay in Canadian dollar to, to allow you to move to Canada. And that makes a huge difference. So it's, mm -hmm. I, I can't believe how your mom like pulled it off. I'm tell, dude, this woman is a hustler. I'm telling you, she used to, she used to like work like three jobs. She never like Mondays to Fridays, seven days a week. This woman work. She rarely takes days off. And then she has hustles, side hustles. Sometimes she like sells t-shirts or whatever she has to get, get on to just to send money back home and eventually obviously bring us to Canada. She st still work like that or now that you guys are okay, still she took it easy? Immigrant, bro, they don't stop. They don't know <laughs> what retirement means. They say the word retirement, but that doesn't mean anything to them. <laughs> Does that give you some kind of guiltness or... I don't know, like, I feel like you, you have to perform that well or not really? Um, when I was younger, not really. She's amazing. My mom and my dad, in a way, they were just like, do your best. Follow your dreams. We're going to support you. That's it. You know? Because that's But what I however, usually hear from people that, like, children of immigrants, they usually, there's like this high expectation to perform well because you know what they have to go through to be able to create a new life abroad. You have, it's, it's hard. So you kind of put mm -hmm. that pressure and expectation to your children and, and you can feel that I, there's like multiple experience out there. They're like talking about their immigrants, parents, like being very strict. They, especially mm -hmm. on, on, on a, um, educational level, they put a lot of pressure on the children to have good education, become doctors or all of that. I kind of mm -hmm. think there's, So many examples, even in the movies about immigrants, parents, immigrants. So wasn't the case for you then? No, my mom has always been like, do your best. That's it. Be ha as long as you're happy, that's all, that's all we care about. You know, in a way, in a way it's good and bad, you know, I would have been a doctor. No, I'm lying. <laughs> I won't be a doctor. Person. <laughs> But you know what I mean? Like there was no pressure at all. It's just like, do your best, you know, don't just don't fail. And be happy. Do whatever you want to do. Be happy. And so, but going back to your question, if I felt guilt, maybe a little bit, but again, we, because of their approach, not really. And I'm very close with my family. I mean, like, we're very close. I, I'm kind of curious now because you moved from the Philippines, like you were living in a, in, in a small town in the Philippines, growing up poor, and then moving to Canada. How was your experience mm. when you landed to Canada? Here's the thing with the Philippines is we're very westernized because after the Spanish World War II, it was the Japanese. After that, American. From that, it's just American, right? So we're very westernized. So we kind of know what to expect, what houses looks like, people, all this stuff. So, But when I came here, one, the main feeling that I felt when I came here was it felt like this insane pressure and stress of poverty and all those uh, violence around living around violence it just whoop, gone it was like oh shit i can breathe here man i'll be okay here i'll be fine uh, the trauma is still there of like living in a violent uh, country but that was my main feeling it was wow i'm gonna be okay You know, because again, if you if you came from poverty and you suddenly you can, you know, afford things, you'll be like, yo, I'm balling, man. Like I remember that my first job here was I was a crew for a fast food company, right? I make like seven dollars something. It was nothing, right? I went, I then I got paid the first pay I ever got in my entire whole life. I went to the bank, took out, I think, $300 of it. Mm -hmm. Yo, dude, I thought I was Lil Wayne, like making it rain balling, <laughs> you know? I felt, I'm not joking. I felt like I was the richest guy in the whole wide world because that was the biggest amount of money that I ever held in my hand. $300, you know? And... Yeah, I was just, I was so proud of myself too, because $300. Also, I think this is not being spoken enough with 
immigrant podcast that immigrants, when they come to a different country, they they have issues with the currency change of the money. Mm -hmm. So when you like me, I from the Philippines, I came to Canada. The exchange rate was a dollar is equals to I think forty pesos now. Mm -hmm. So every time you want to buy, I don't know, a bottle of water will be $5. So your brain as an immigrant will be like, okay, $5 is equals to this. Holy, for a bottle of water is like, I don't know, I'm not good with math, like 2,500 pesos. That's insane. It's just water. So it makes you make more, makes you more frugal. Mm -hmm. You don't want to spend more because of that. Or sometimes, and it goes reverse too, because if you ask your friend, oh, how much is a t-shirt in the Philippines? They'll be like, oh, it's a, uh, I don't know, 5,000 pesos. And you'll be like, what? It's so cheap. I could buy 10 right now. But not really. Because it's, you know what I mean? So that's one thing, like, the main thing that I feel like it's not been spoken enough is, is it's part of the culture shock that no one talks about is the exchange rate. Mm -hmm. I mean, especially, I mean, probably it's mostly for people in your situation that come from um, a, a poor country. Can I, can I say poor country? Is that, is that it is like a poor a, country. <laughs> no, I don't know if it's like a politically correct. I don't know exactly where the line is. Like between. Uh, They say it's a developing country. Bro, let's get it to the point. <laughs> poor country. Okay. Like coming from a poor country into like a westernized or like a... Um, a, a I don't know, a, a, a different country like Canada. Yeah, you can see the difference. You can see the difference, like how much, how more expensive everything is. For mm. people in my circumstances that I grew up in Italy, that moved to move abroad, but was the exchange that you mentioned was not that different. I mean, you need to, no, actually it was not that different. It's just instead of a, mm. a dollar is a euros, actually instead of a euro is a dollar 60 or something like that, but that's pretty much it. It doesn't make much yeah. of a difference. But it's, it's, it will be reversed for people. Maybe they are listening or watching. Maybe it could be the difference, like for people that are coming from a more um, developed country, going to, I don't know, Thailand, for example. That for me was going, mm. to, going to Thailand for the first time. I felt like I was the freaking richest person on earth. Yo, like a, you're a king. Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Everything is cheap and you feel like you're a wealthy person. Or like, like going to the restaurant, you don't even check. Mm the prices mm. of the thing. First of all, I don't even know. I, I, I'm lazy. I don't want to do the conversion. And also like, you don't have to worry about mm. how much things cost because you can afford anything. So it's yeah. the opposite. I mean, hey, also, let's not fool around. You're white. That always is a good currency. True. true. No, yeah, true. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> it, but yes, sticking with currency, yes, it, it goes reverse too. And yes, I agree with you. If you're from a from a developed country, like a G20 country, and then going to a, another G20 country, like it's not really a problem. But I'm I'm more talking about like people like that comes from a poor country going to a well developed country. Mm -hmm. no. You come home, you're you're a king. I mean, you're a king. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely, and. Like when you guys moved to Canada, were you still poor or at that point you were financially okay? I mean, I mean, it's hard. Here, if, they, if you're a Canadian and you, they saw us, they'll be saying, oh, we're poor because we live in an apartment, right? People will say, oh, they're poor. But for us, bro, what are you talking about? A roof over our head? The, the floor is cement. We're good, dude. We're safe. There's running water. Oh, by the way, there's hot water too. Mm. You know what I mean? Like we were good. Of course, we still have to work. We, as soon, I, I, again, like when, as soon as we got to Canada, life was like, pff, we couldn't complain anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's like what I meant. I'm not comparing you to other people because that's not a fair compare, comparison. Especially because mm. I, I can talk to, yes, you mentioned I'm white, so I have a different privilege. I don't mm. really know my privilege because I don't know how to compare to because it's mm. not like a currency. I go to another country and I see the difference. I've never been a different mm. color. So unfortunately, mm. I don't have the experience. But even though when I moved from Italy to New Zealand, the things you have to do, and even though financially I was 
doing okay. I was, I was able to pay the bills. I didn't go to bed hungry, but still mm. the job that I was doing for people, maybe born in the same country, they look down to you because it's things they will never do. But you do because you're an immigrant and you have to pay the bills. Mm. That's what I'm saying. Like for your perspective, not for other people's perspective. For you at that point, you guys were financially okay. You were able to pay, yeah. pay the rent, mm. live in a house and I guess not going to bed uh, hungry. That's what I meant by say like financially okay. Yeah, like like I said earlier, like, and I wasn't comparing myself to others. I'm just saying if you look for statistics, mm -hmm. that's what I'm talking about. You know, is yeah, if you see, yeah, we're like in a, you know, lower income family in Canada, but for us, we're the king of the world, man. Like I said, there's a roof, there's walls, there's hot water. We're not missing, you know, dinner, or we're not missing. We could buy whatever we want to buy in a certain amount, mm -hmm. right? Like, I was gro growing up, I get uh, one pair of shoes each year, one pair of shoes. And that's only in Christmas, if my family can afford it. And it's like, you see Walmart, I mean, you see like a grocery store, not grocery, but um, Walmart, sh like shoes, like they're not the best. Bro, that's like... Michael Jordan's Air Jordan shoes for us, mm -hmm. like lower level than that. That's what I'm saying. Like once we got here, we didn't feel poor. We were, we look back and we're like, okay, that's our life. We're here now and we can afford pretty much, you know, things that we could afford. We're not poor anymore. You know, however, if you talk to people that live here in Canada, They're like, well, not really. You're not really, you know, you're still poor because mm -hmm. you live in this, you live in, you know what I mean? Yep. Like statistically. Mm -hmm. Oh, I, I, I totally get it. And also I'd like to know your experience because you moved to Canada when you, you when you were in, in your 20s with your family. So your mom was already living in Canada and she found a way mm -hmm. to sponsor you guys or find uh, an immigration process, immigration journey for you guys to all move to Canada. So you your siblings and your dad, right? Mm. So how was your experience moving to Canada with the, with the whole family? Was it like going on, was like going on a long vacation or something? Um, I remember the night that we're leaving, my family was like, yo, you're the one who's going to talk to all the customs. I'm like, why me? I'm like, because you're the one who speaks English. <laughs> like, I'm like, I do, but you know, like it's different when you're actually having a conversation with someone that speaks fluent English, but which I did, but the journey was, it was sad, dude. Because <laughs> you know, you're leaving family, you're leaving your girlfriend or boyfriend, whatever you with have, we had was like, The whole time we were crying. I was crying. But the thing was, I was pushing my feelings down because I don't want to show to my dad and my brother that I'm crying. But I knew they were crying too. <laughs> but it, the traveling was fine. I hate flying. Even today, I hate flying. Really? So that was an issue. To, I hate flying. Bro, I hate it. Once it's up in the air and it's like relaxed, I'm good. But when it starts shaking or like the lift off and oh, bro. That's the best part. No bueno. <laughs> No, 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 it's not. That's the worst part. So that, um, and then we got here, we were received by my mom, which is like, dude, it was like, it, maybe it's not fair to say, but it was like when, uh, when the Jews was freed and finally like, whoa, we're good. Not in, like when the Mo Moses helped the Jews to be free, like, out of poverty, you know, mm -hmm. it was like, wow, we're good, dude. We are good. We're okay. That, uh, yeah. Yeah. So it was, the flight was good. When, then we arrived here, it was October. So it was a bit cold. But again, the feeling of like, we had this feeling that you can't complain because mm -hmm. you made it, dude. You made it. For some people, You know, people are like, I want to immigrate because I travel. I want to see people. I want to see different things. We need to travel. We need to immigrate because we're going to die of starvation if we don't do it. You know, it's a different situation. And also, I think it's worth mentioning that 
from like the age of eight when your mom left until 20 when you moved to Canada, you were seeing your mom every every two years. So now you were able to even spend time with your mom and being be back to be a family together. Yeah, yeah. I, I thank you for mentioning that because I love mentioning that because it just shows how badass my mom is that she'll leave for two years, comes back to visit us for a month. And that lasted from I was eight to 20 when I finally arrived in Canada. And it, it was hard, but we had a goal. We knew we had a goal. This is what we have to do to, you know, get away from this poverty. Mm-hmm. But I mean, like, yes, a lot of credit to your mom. We already mentioned this, but even from your dad and even you guys, like, no, it, because he, he told me last time when you, when your mom left, there was no like hard feeling that, oh, mom left us and all that. There was none of that from your part. Was that because you mentioned even this last night, like this is kind of like a, a cultural thing in the Philippines. A lot of like a, your friends at school, their parent, one of their mm-hmm. parents would have done the same. Mm-hmm. So they can this feeling of like your mom is providing for you and didn't leave you was part of the culture or was that your dad that would just don't know, give you, put that in your mind and put that in your head? No, it's part of the culture. Like, it, like ever since I had like, rem- I could remember things like, oh, this person's mom is, you know, living there. This dad, this person's dad is, you know, working there. I've known people since we were young their fam, their mom or their dad will be, I don't know, in Saudi or whatever else. Till we got old, until I left Philippines, that person still in whatever country they are migrated to. It's just, it is just how it is. You know, it's just part of, it's part of life. Unfortunately, you know, it's, it, they're actually, actually talking about it now because there's going to be an election for the Philippines and how in quote unquote important OFW people for the Philippines because they they are nine they nine percent of the GDP of the Philippines are came from the remittances of this OFW. That's mm. how big it is. However, the social impact is the problem too because families are being broken up, right? Because mom and dad has to leave to you know to for uh, to help uh, the family. It yeah, brings a lot of money inside of the country, as you said. Yeah, it does, but then the social impact. Like I grew, I grew up without my mom. Yeah, no, exactly. You know, especially back then, there was no internet. You know, it was a phone, and we didn't have a phone. It was the neighbor's phone. It was expensive to call abroad. Maybe. Yeah, it was expensive. It was expensive to uh, to call from uh, you know whatever you're from. Um, but I we talked to my mom like once a month on the phone and again like i told you it's my neighbor's phone mm-hmm. they they're the only have one they're the only people that have a phone for some reason in our neighborhood so we'll use their phone whenever my mom calls yeah that's crazy to even think about it like honestly like <laughs> yeah people that have- there was like a few years i don't see my mom we'll just write letters like literally letters sent letter to to her then once a lot once in a month once a month or a few, maybe sometimes twice she'll call and we'll just talk and dude it sucks yeah <laughs> no facetime you know yeah, no exactly and that's what probably i love about stories like yours that put everything in perspective for people that they're listening and thinking oh i want to move abroad but i don't know if it's like see what other people have been through moving abroad right now it's so much easier than it has ever been like now you can FaceTime, mm. like we are having a mm. conversation from like outside of like between like the two sides of the countries, like mm. like we are in the same room almost. You can have mm. that experience, but you yeah, couldn't that in the past. So if you are like, a, like in the point where like, I don't know if I want to move abroad, like please do because it's never been so easy. Still n- challenging thing to do, but still like, like can't be any easier than this. Yeah, FaceTime is it changed the game mm. it changed the game i have uh, friends and family members that are you know immigrants or migrants that you know their family or their kids are back home and i'm like yo you guys got it good i'm not saying it's 100 percent perfect but man that facetime is so it's such a big deal it 
you know, like we just have letters and phone. I don't, of course, resent them. That's it is what it is. But I'm just telling you, like, you guys got it good. It, like you said, it's moving abroad is easier because of that. Oh, absolutely. I'll give you an example. When I left Italy for the first time, when I left Italy, I, uh, my niece was one month old. So she was just born. And the second time I came back, I think, was after a year, a year and a half. And we always saw each other like every single Sunday. We were like, I will see my, I will call my brother over FaceTime. I see my nephew mm-hmm. and my niece. My nephew was a little bit older at the time. But my niece, mm-hmm. she always saw me a part of the first month and then was there, but she always saw me through an iPad, through like a FaceTime. Mm-hmm. And the beauty of the first time I went back to Italy, I was worried that she might not recognize me. But as soon as she saw me, she smiled at me and she started running mm-hmm. and running like a jump to my arms. And that's uh, the mm. powerful of technology that you can do, that you can create. They have still have a relationship. She never met me in person. She always saw me through a, a screen and still she was able to recognize mm. me. And like knowing that I was her uncle was amazing. Yeah. I'm, I mean, I'm happy for you that you have that connection with her because it's, it's precious. Absolutely. And that put even your life, your experience even in, a, in such a different perspective because I don't know like as I said I was uncle I was the uncle mm. and it's different the relation between an uncle and a niece and an if is different from a parent mm. and a son it's uh, uh yeah yeah I mean that's credit to my family too with the support that we have and my grandma and my aunts that like made sure that uh you we respect our mom and we know the goal and we understand why she's there and we, I, our, my relationship with my mom was always been strong. Even though we didn't have FaceTime, we only have phone calls once in a while. We have letters once in a while. It's, we were super, the con- relationship was strong. When she comes home, man, we're like, you know, heaven, right? Mm-hmm. When she leaves, that kind of stuff, yeah. <laughs> always. But yeah, we, 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 it was never a problem. Our relationship, it was always strong. We never had like the moment of like, oh, why, why are you in Hong Kong? Why don't you just stay here and everything? Because we know, we know she cannot stay, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's the other thing because culturally, I don't know if you heard the same thing, you probably did. Like people are looking at people like your mom in a bad way because it's like, oh, they're making money here. They don't spend in the country. They don't doing anything good for their economy. They're just sending money back home. When you hear a story like yours and see why people are doing that, they give you like a completely different take on the, this experience. Like the, their life is just like, how can you even think about the economy on your country when it's, it's doing pretty well? Like there's, mm-hmm. I, I don't know. I'm, I love like stories like yours because put everything at dif- on a different light, on a different perspective that people to understand exactly mm-hmm. what's going on behind the scene that people not don't talk about it. Mm-hmm. Get it. By the way, just to add on the comment that you said, like, oh, people are like, oh, why are you sending money back to the Philippines, to your country? Those people are racist. That's what it's called. That's what they're called. You know, it's, just, it's well, not just racist. I think it's a, a lot of ignorance because they don't well, know. Racists are ignorant people. True. But the, not all the <laughs> ignorance are racist. <laughs> just a different category. Yeah, of course. You know, but people will always say things, you know, people will always say things that like, Again, it's insecurity, you know? Yeah, no, no, totally. Uh, Insecurity, uh, I think, comes a lot of ignorance because people don't know exactly what's going on. They are based on the the headlines and what the other people say. It's just uh, a lot of ignorance. That's that's what it comes Mm -hmm. down to. Mm -hmm. And because you moved to Canada and we pretty much like, you guys have to start from zero pretty much, right? And now... Like we were talking to you, like you now you you have a house, you have a family, and all that thing. So you are, you did really well. Like from coming from zero, you did really well. How did you? Mm, how did you do you. it? How did you? How did you do? Like going through, like I'm starting going from zero to one hundred or whatever you are right now. To be honest, I'd like to say something inspirational, but really, I just got lucky, man. My main thing was I had an amazing family. That is the main thing. Once I had that support, I felt like I cannot do wrong. And if I do wrong, I can try again. And 
but to like but to ask answer your question I just got lucky to to be honest when I came here my plan was to go to school which I did I went to school but I was doing school full time and I was working uh, working full time as well that's extremely hard mm-hmm. I burn up myself I'm like oh I don't want to do it I liked school I always liked school no actually no I always I always loved learning but I didn't like school because you know it's a group and some are smarter than others and I felt like they they feed you so much of information that you don't need mm-hmm. you know like I don't know cylinder when are you going to use the cylinder like bro leave me alone you know I want to do something else so because of that I couldn't focus pretty much and i just one one day I, i i was dating my now wife i said yo i'm going back to the philippines i'm going to visit just to like you know take a day off take a time off but and I'm, i'm i'm going to stop school i'm going to continue after i never did <laughs> i came back i never did i only had like a year left to graduate But I never came back. I was like, okay, screw that. I don't, I don't want to go back to school. And I felt like I was just bouncing around, bouncing around, doing like random jo- jobs. And then again, luck just struck. I found this work. I was um, I was an unloader. You know those semi trucks that pulls uh, containers, mm-hmm. Contain- yep. uh, shipping Ship- containers. Yep. I used to like lift them, dude. Like whatever inside, we will put whatever it's inside usually it, it was a company of speakers so we'll grab speakers put it on the on the pallet and wrap it up mm-hmm. and then put away that was my job for I don't know three years four years whatever and I but I knew I'm not bragging but I knew I'm better than that I knew it's not a bad job it's a decent job but for me I could do better you know and I just like I was thinking of looking for a job looking for a job but nothing was happening and then somehow my boss quote unquote promoted me brought me to the warehouse office and from there I worked myself up to work in the main office and from there I was just a clerk you know just doing invoice and whatnot like you know it's an easy job you know let's not fool around but I got the job like February and in June I was a purchasing manager. Oh wow. Yeah, I was like what? But even just it, it was crazy. But even just the jump from working um as a trader or working like a lifting speaker going to an office usually that step it seems like you you made it because usually people in the office are usually uh, higher education and usually people like us immigrants they They don't work in the office right away. So even, I guess, we'll, like even just going to jump into the office, that would be, must be like a big jump into your career. And you do just feeling of, I, I not made it. Oh, probably at that point, it felt like you made it, right? Yeah. But I always stay humble. Even though I say I'm, I'm humble, which is ironic. But I was like, I never, I never look at the position. I look off the challenge of the position more than anything. So when I was lifting those boxes, which is, by the way, the most fun job I've ever had. First of all, it's physical. Second of all, you're just shooting the shit with your coworkers. There was no stress at all. No mm-hmm. stress. We walk in, we walk out. That's it. But from the job, I got to another position and getting to that purchasing manager position. Like I said, I don't know, dude. It was just like this ziggy, like the, li- the planets lined up. And I got that position. Someone quit. I walked in. Oh, by the way, you it's going to be you now. And I'll be like, okay, let's just do this. It, and I love the job. I enjoy that job a lot. Must have been just it was, like, uh, it can be even like a, probably the hard work you put in. It might be your, just uh, your work ethic that like the people, they've I been mean, discovered. I'm good by- looking too, you know? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, I, yes. Yeah, I, I guess it's a hard work. Like my, um, or my VP, vice president, of the company then was like, yo, you putting all the work, a lot of work. And this woman, this person, the purchasing manager was quitting and she liked me too. She thought I was smart, which is, uh, I don't know what I'm, what made her think that. 
Um, so they offered me the job. I'm like, yeah, okay, let's do it. And I didn't even think what entails with the job. I just like, yeah, I want to do it. I, that's all I did. It's just like blind ambition, I guess. I don't know. And it's like, yeah, let's do it. And I, I did it. I, uh, it was a fun job because it's, it deals with mus- musicians. So I met a lot of musicians. We go to concerts a lot for free, VIP. We go in the backstage, which I don't like, by the way. I never enjoyed going backstage. Why? It's not fun because, you know, you meet the... Some bands are good. Some bands are okay. But most of them, especially if they're young, they just want women Mm -hmm. to talk to. So sometimes they'll be nice to you. Like, hey, how are you? Then they see a hot chick coming in. (laughs) Forget about you. They're not even going to talk to you, you know? I'd like to ask you one thing just because I want to know like a if your experience when you moved to Canada was similar to mine when I moved abroad, when I moved to New Zealand, hmm. did you feel like when you, like seeing people in Canada, maybe, especially if, maybe in your perspective, where you see people being, living a good life, maybe driving nice car, living like a big apartment or big houses and all that things, that seeing people kind of quote unquote made it, did it make you hmm. believe that you can do anything? you were able to do whatever you want in life and without having the boundary or the thing that you said to yourself, the thing that you can only do and not do? Mm, yeah. Yeah. I felt like once I got to Canada, I felt like it's a level position. You know what I mean? I Again, I know there are like racism and white privilege and whatever else, the factor. But when I, that was like the first time I was like, yeah, I can do things here. I can buy a car. I can work in a fast food company, be a crew, the lowest position, and I could still buy a car. In the Philippines, you could be a bank manager and wouldn't even buy a car at all. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So with that, seeing like people that, you know, have menial jobs and they could actually afford a house maybe, or, you know, maybe have two cars, bro. It's like, yo, I can do whatever I want to do here. You know, if I put myself, you know, again, like with my, with my quote unquote success, if you want to call it that, it was just like, if I always believe like you put in the work, good things will happen. Not 100%, but most of the time. Yeah. As you say, there's like, it's just a step ladder. You can just grow and grow and there's no limit to that. Maybe back in the Philippines, as you say, even if you get up to the ladder to become like a bank manager but still not able to live the life full not full, full, full fulfillment but not the life that you might want to be or like a comfortable life that's the thing then and when you come to a country like canada or other country for me even from italy to new zealand i felt the same thing that i can i, I can do anything i can do whatever i put my mm-hmm. mind into mm-hmm. oh yeah most definitely but just the, you have that you you suddenly has for me at least like sense of like possibility right Mm -hmm. like oh there's opportunities here and if i apply myself in a way i could achieve that possible that opportunity like like my story from a guy lifting boxes and wrapping them up to a purchasing manager in a few months that's not gonna happen in the philippines yeah and or if it does the chance is like 0.01 you know and in even if i was a purchasing manager in the philippines the chance of me, you know, achieving what I have achieved in Canada, it's very low. It was super low. Yeah, 100%. 100%. And I'd like to ask you, mm-hmm. when you moved, when you left the, the Philippines and moved to Canada, what did your friends, and did you, like your circle of friends, that told you? Like, what, what did they say about you? Or like, happy for you? What was the situation there? So most of them are, again, it's the culture, right? Like, it's the way of life. Someone's going to move anytime soon. It could be this guy. It could be this guy. It could be that guy. But most of them, they're happy. Well, I mean, the night off or a few nights, a few weeks or a few months before it, we got the visa, it was like, we were sad. Mm-hmm. You know, they were sad for me. And it was a funny situation because back then I used to have a camcorder or camera. Oh, like a, okay. They call it camcorder, but it's, a, you know, like a mobile mm-hmm. camera, right? 
with the tape. Okay, yes, the back tape. in the days, yes. So I had that. My mom sent it to me like back then. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to videotape every day. Every day of my life. Did you do it? Because, yeah, I did. Because like my 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 thing my thing was like this will never happen again. Mm-hmm. This part of my life will never ever happen again. Even though some of my friends were like no 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 you're coming home this and that whatever. I'm like no, I knew it's not gonna happen. I'm gonna videotape. I videotape almost every day, dude. Like it could I could be like eating uh, breakfast or whatever with someone. I'm videotaping it. We go drinking. I videotape it. I still have them actually. Some of them you cannot use because it's too, the, 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 the video is not so good and the audio is like terrible. Mm-hmm. But I, there are few that usable, you know? But yeah, that's, that's what I did. And going back to your question, it's just, they were happy because, you know, they know something. I'm going to get opportunities, right? Like uh, the group of friends of mine, let's say we're 20 guys and girls mixed. I'll say about 80% of them is migrants or immigrants. What, what do you mean? Like the 80% left Philippines to move abroad? So, yeah, 80% have left the Philippines. Oh, okay. Or, uh, or working or living abroad, you know. Um, yeah, it's, it was just the way of life. So it wasn't like a surprise. Like, oh, you're moving to a different country? Oh, I'll be sad or whatever. Of course, there's going to be mm-hmm. sadness because you know you're going to leave and that's going to be it, right? Okay. Like, and you won't see them like before, like literally every day we see each other. Now we're like, we see them like a decade, <laughs> if you're lucky, you know? Yeah, exactly. Especially if they're like all spread all over the world. Yeah, exactly. Oh, that's what I, that's what I thought. But I maybe I thought maybe you were one of the lucky ones that like managed to, to leave the Philippines and maybe they will see you like with the envies or see you like, oh, you lucky like you managed to to get away, but apparently that wasn't the case. I was more literally like another one goes envy. No, I, I I don't see. There's no envy. Like oh, I mean they'll say like oh you're lucky you're going you're moving. That's uh, always going to be a statement, but in a way that comes with comes with you know like jealousy. No. It was just like, oh, you're moving. Oh, in a few years, I'm moving too. Or I'm going to go to this country in a few months. And and literally, it was like from 20 guys, let's say, I don't know exact the number. It was like, I leave, this person's leaving in a few months. This person's leaving in a few months. It was like one after the other, you know. But yeah, but we, I was lucky that way. Like most of my friends was like, well, at least some of them that I that they told me, I was, maybe some of them will be like, lucky son of a gun, you know? You mentioned this time, even last time that we were talking about like Canada, you love Canada, it's a great country, which I have to agree. Mm-hmm. It's a great country for mm-hmm. immigrants, even though there's still some racism. I mean, there's racism everywhere, but still a great country. Mm-hmm. What's, what mm-hmm. would be your top three reason for, uh, for the listeners or for other people that you would give to, to move to Canada? Top three reasons. Well, the main thing what you just said is they're awesome with immigrants. They're so welcoming, right? They're, you come in and, you know, again, there are racism, there's racist, but you feel welcome here. Most people are kind, you know, they'll just, they don't bother you at all. That the first one, second one is opportunities opportunities is just man it's there it's for you to take it you know just work your way up towards that again there's white privilege there's whatever else that we cannot control but at least it's an opportunity i always remember my a uh, friend of mine that lives in the states and unfortunately he's not He's not open-minded on things. He was always mad at like, oh, you know, I could never achieve the things that I want to do because of white people and I'm Chinese, I'm, I'm Asian. I'm like, like, you know, because of the color of my skin. I'm like, bro, I'm in, I'm in the same situation. Plus, I'm in Quebec, which we speak French and I don't speak fluent French. And look at me, I'm doing okay. You know what I mean? Like that, that should not stop you. 
That should, you, yes, these things exist. I'm not denying, but it should not stop you from pursuing and achieving your goals, whatever the goal is. Of course, there's a main goal. If you don't get it, there are other goals. You know what I mean? So opportunities. Uh, lastly, I don't know, dude, nature, I guess. Man, Canada's gorgeous, man. It's so beautiful. The foliage. It, you know, the mountains is gorgeous. Yeah. You know, like BC is gorgeous, you know. Uh, Alberta is beautiful. Like different places here, it's, it's, it's something to experience, you know. It's, and it's such a, an, a massive country. So you can have like, <laughs> so much to see. And like I said, like I, said I was surprised yeah, when I came here, like how big this country is. It was hard for me to wrap my head around it, like how big this country is. It is, man. Like, listen, I've been living here in Quebec for, I don't know, close to two decades. There are still places I haven't been to. <laughs> Even like close by. I'm not talking about like the end of Quebec to the other end of Quebec. I'm talking about just like a few towns over. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, whoa. What is this place? Like, it's so big and it's so beautiful, you know? And obviously, forget about the weather because the weather sucks. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, there's opportunities, you know? I always joke that when the weather's bad here in Quebec and we get dump of snow, I'm talking about like thick, right? Mm -hmm. And sometimes people will say like, hey, you're from the Philippines, a beautiful country. Why did you move to Quebec? And I'll be like, because I don't want to starve to death. That's why. <laughs> That's a pretty good reason. You know, it's just, it's just like my mantra that I say, but in like, not in a negative way. It's actually a positive way. But I just like saying that because I have this dark sense of humor, mm -hmm. you know. And also I think we were talking about this last time, I mean, just for like having a reset your perspective because you said like Canada made you soft, which is something to hear from other people too. <laughs> and the fact that you, the things that you taking from granted now because that's normal I think everybody does the same thing even though your situation is coming from nothing but when you got something you you started taking it for granted you mentioned this mm. the last time when we spoke that sometimes you have like this moment that like odd reset of your perspective like oh my god like I'm taking things from granted when I I was I think you mentioned I said like you mentioned this story last time about this basketball that was like a pretty much like mm. done Uh, you, you as a Canadian now, you saw that as a garbage and you took it back to the Philippines and the kids were like going mental, like were like so happy about like this basketball mm. that you thought was just garbage. Even that perspective, mm. that's where I came from. Like, that's what I'm like going to with this, that you say like, I didn't want to start. Like why? The, the weather is not a big deal when the problem in life, <laughs> it's, it's something else. It's like between well, mm. bad weather and starvation, <laughs> like a big like weather every single day of the week mm -hmm. I can guarantee you if we go to the Philippines right now and we offer a hundred million people who move to Canada I can guarantee you maybe a, a handful of people will say no I can guarantee you that <laughs> mm -hmm. you know because it's it's uh, it's really it's really extremely hard but going back to your to the reference that you said basketball uh, yeah the story is me sending back this basketball, a ball that is like finished. I mean, like it's so smooth because we've used that so much and we sent it to the Philippines and people were like so grateful that they have a basketball, which I was considering for myself was like garbage. And like you said, going to their point again, is just, it makes you grateful. Like, holy crap, man, I got it good. And there are times that like that, you know, we're human beings. We get comfortable. We're like, oh my God, my car, oh my, oh, whatever, you know, oh, hydro or whatever else. Oh, the internet is slow. And then I call to my family or friend back home. They'll be like, yo, I don't even know if we're going to eat tomorrow. <laughs> It's absolutely like I, I say, is it, it's a hard reset of your perspective of being grateful for the things that you have and the things that the, the things you achieved as well, because it's something that you need to remind yourself that sometimes like mm -hmm. when you feel down, like feel like the thing that you did, the things that you achieved, you're for like coming mm -hmm. from the Philippines with nothing. And now in, in your career and your job and your life and family and all of that things, I think that you need to keep like, remind to yourself, I think. Yeah, it's 
like I, I think I mentioned to you before, it's like every time I come home and driving down my street and I look at the houses and I'll say to myself, it, it still surprises me. I don't know why. Again, I'm not the smartest people person in the whole wide world, but I'm like, I live here. I have a house here. And it blows my mind all the time. Like, wow, good job, buddy. Good job. You know? And sometimes people will say, like, oh, you know, I wish, oh, oh, that house there, the, your neighbor's house is bigger than, it's bigger, it's nicer, you know? And I'll be like, oh, excuse me, I'm from negative zero back home in the Philippines. I came here, I started negative zero again, and if, you know what? He's my neighbor. He doesn't live in, I don't know, Beverly Hills or whatever else. What's the problem here? There's an, you know what I mean? Like it makes me, I'm not pulling down other people, obviously, but it's just like, it makes me proud. Like, God damn, I made it, mm -hmm. dude. Like I did it. Like, I, I, you, that little boy that's playing in the field, wondering of moving. I don't know how he's going to move. Thinking of like, oh, someday I'm going to move. I'm going to have a house. I'm going to have two cars. I'm going to have a family. Guess what? He achieved that goal. Whatever else is gravy. Man, that's amazing. Honestly, that's amazing. Just if, yeah, <laughs> the fact that you you I, believe from like a, such a young age that you will made it, and you here you here you are. I, by the way, I don't know how I did it. It just I just believe that it's gonna happen. That I'm gonna move, and somehow puzzles keeps on falling in the right position. Next thing you know, I was in Canada. And the, the funny thing was moving here too, it was a, we had like some issues to moving here because um, when we were planning to move here, we were old. My, my siblings, I was above 18 years old. I was 20, like I said, right? Mm -hmm. And usually you get supported by your your parents or whoever's supporting you. You have to be 18 and lower and younger, right? Yep. I was 20 and I was the youngest youngest in the family. We still made it. I don't know how we made it. We just, we, we still, the government somehow said like, yeah, come in. Don't worry about it. You know, and we, when we were applying for the papers too, was we got all the papers done. And in the Philippines, there's so much papers you need. I mean, dude, it, it, like you have to go to different documents. And I'm not, I'm not going to go in detail, but you need so much doc, doc, silly documents. There's definitely more roadblocks. Yeah, there's this, definitely more roadblocks from yeah. people coming from the Philippines than somebody coming from the UK or from Europe. Yeah, exactly. So we got all the documents. We submitted to the Canadian embassy. In a few months, there were bombings in the Philippines. Mm. And there was a bombing close to the U.S. Embassy and they closed the U.S. Embassy and all the embassy closed, even the Canadian Embassy. When they opened it, our papers were all expired. So we had to redo an extra pretty cost. much all of it. <laughs> and then we just continued. Again, credit to my mom sending all the money because that's not cheap. No, it wasn't you know. cheap for me. I tell you that. Like it wasn't cheap for me. It, it, yeah, you know, and imagine us coming from a poor country, yeah. three people, uh, three people, no, four people moving. I don't know. Again, I don't know how my mom did it. It's just magic, <laughs> not magic, but perseverance. Might have to interview so, yeah, your like, mom on the podcast. <laughs> I'll ask her. I don't. I don't. I don't know if she's uh, she's okay. She loves podcasts, but I, I don't know. But I'll ask her. But yeah, it's just. Miracle, dude. Uh, again, I don't, I don't know if it's manifestation or whatever it is. It just, it happens. Click, click, click. It happens. And we don't even, my mom, you, and how we got here is it was my uncle's wife's brother was living in Quebec and he supported his sister, which is my uncle's sister. See how rich it mm -hmm. is? How the possibility for us to come here and it's happened anyway. Yeah, because that couldn't happen when your mom was working in Hong Kong, right? Because it, there, there's no way no. you can move your family to Hong Kong. No way. There's, 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 it's not going to happen. But to, again, like, I knew we couldn't, we were not going to move to Hong Kong. I knew it. But I knew we we're going to move somewhere. I don't know where. I don't know how. 
but it's gonna happen, and it just happened. So when you when you were a kid, we were thinking of gonna move ab- some someday we are gonna move abroad. Was any country that you were thinking of, or not really? Um, being Filipino and Americanized, the first country would be America, mm-hmm. right? Like the first thing. But for me, it was not really a. It was just a, for me, like when I envision it, even now, if I try to remember, mem- my memory is like, there's nothing specific. There's no, it's not America or UK or whatever. I always had this feeling that I was born in the wrong country. I don't know why, but I just like had that feeling. I love being Filipino. I am proud to be Filipino. I love going back to the Philippines. But I always had that feeling that like, I don't belong here. I don't, it's, this is not where I should be. I always have that westernized mentality that like, sometimes I talk to people and they'll say like, why do you think that way? That's not, that's completely reversed the way we think, you know? I'm always like, now in being individualistic is a cool thing to say. Right, like, oh, take care of yourself first, self, self-care. I've always been like, have a self-care in mind, you know? But people are like, no, 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 you have to think about the family and the community because that's the Eastern thinking, mm-hmm. right? But I always had that self-care thing, like, not that I'm like, you know, oh, I need to do self-care, but I've always like uh, had this individualistic mindset. So it was like a, a contrast in my in the community I was grow, growing up in. But I always knew I was like, I was going to move. Uh, which country? Like your question? I well, There was no specific one. Whatever. Oh, this is how I answer actually this question. It's I call it the burning room allegory. Okay. Imagine you're in a room and the room is on fire. And around the room, there are different doors. Behind those doors, you don't know what's behind them. It could be a lion. It could be, I don't know, a group of people about to shoot you or, a, I don't know, shark that's going to eat you. Mm-hmm. You don't care which door you're going to open or you're going to go through. It's whichever door opens, that's what you're going to go out to because you don't want to be in, on fire. Mm-hmm. That's what the feeling is. And mo- unfortunately, most of the people that lives in the Philippines, and I'm assuming people that lives in a, in poverty is that like, it doesn't matter what it is. You open it, we're going there. And I'm like being topical now is like in Ukraine, people are moving, right? They're trying to re- seek refugee. They don't care which country, as long as no one's going to shoot exactly. them. You know what I mean? That's, that's the, that was the mentality. Okay. No, I thought maybe you had like something, some, I don't know, a dream of moving to a specific country because I heard from like a Filipino co-worker in, uh, in New Zealand, there a lot of people wanted to move to Italy because they're, as you said, they were Catholics, they're, Christ, they're Christian, they, they have uh, this like a strong religion. And for them to be mm. in Italy and go see the Pope, that was their dream. Like they want to go to Italy so they can see the Pope. Maybe we had something else yeah. like, I want to go to that country because, I don't know, something, I don't know, specific. No, no, not really. But going back to that, uh, I have family in Italy, actually. Mm-hmm. I have an uncle that lives in Italy and I'm assuming why they say that. I don't think it's because of the Pope or anything. That's what they told I mean, me. That's I don't cool. know. But, but I, back as a few years ago, Italy was like the option. Mm-hmm. It, there's always like decades that like this decade is going to be Saudi Arabia. You can migrate to so this decade is going to be Hong Kong. This decade is America. This decade is Italy. There, there are, there's a window in the Philippines in those during years, like for immigrants or of, uh, overseas Filipino workers, it was the Italy. This is how my uncle got to Italy. But yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm guessing just because of that. I don't know about the Pope, bro. I mean, he's cool, but come on. I don't know. That's it. As I said, <laughs> I refer to what other people told me. They're like, people are looking know, at Italy know, like, joking. oh, I can go there so I can go see the Pope. <laughs> That's just... For me, that's not a reason oh. to move to a country. But if you are that religion, <laughs> the red, the, sorry, that mm-hmm. religious, I mean, yeah. I, I mean, for me, I wanted to move to the United States because Silicon Valley is there. That was, that was my dream. I wanted to go and move mm-hmm. to Silicon Valley because there's a tech companies are there. So I can see that a different perspective. For me, it's not the Pope, but for me, it's mm-hmm. a tech company. That's your religion, <laughs> Silicon Valley. <laughs> I guess so. I guess. So. I don't know. Mm-hmm. And... One question, then I, 
I think I know the answer, but I'll ask this question to all my guests. Do you have any regrets mm. about leaving your country, about leaving in the Philippines? I would like to say, I, you know what? I thought about this question before. And I said, I said zero. But then I started thinking more deeper about it. It's not more of regret. To answer your question first, is zero. But again, like we we're talking about earlier, is the the social impact of people immigrating or migrating because they're hungry saddens me. Because, you know, why are these people have to move just to give better life to their family? It was, it was just, it made me, I, I, I thank you for this question, by the way. It made me think and ponder about this deeper that it's sad you know like people have to leave why why do they have to leave of course we know the answer but you know if only people stop being greedy people wouldn't have to leave the country right because of corruption mm -hmm. and all, i i think yeah i totally agree like i'm I don't know, for personal experience, uh, I can't really relate with that, but I heard like this to what other guests, like it's the same thing. I don't have any regrets, but I wish I didn't have to do it. Hmm. But you, how about you? Did you move because of opportunity work-wise or did you want to travel? I just wanted to do something different. I just wanted to experience mm. living abroad. I don't really know what I was expecting. I just didn't want to stay in Italy. I didn't feel safe in my country, not safe as a safety, like a violence, but was mostly like economically safe. And for me, like mm. I want to build a future. I can feel, I can see myself building a, a stable future with this, this, on this unstable ground. That's how I saw Europe at that time. Like this is unstable ground. Mm. I can't put like the foundation on my house on this unstable ground. So I just wanted something else. I wanted to be, I don't know, for me, it was just living Italy, living Europe and yeah. just, try something and I have to say like as you pointed out I'm white I'm absolutely privileged I can feel that I, I know that and I was living a good life I was just mm. I didn't have any issue I could live I could actually live a nice life comfortable life in Italy and that's what like mm. there was the, the like the what the, my friends were telling me like what Daniel what are you doing you have a great job you have friends and all that things you're like why do you have to live like it's hard to explain it, it was hard for me to explain to other people like i don't know they just i have to do it i just want to do it mm, it's wonderlust i guess so but mm -hmm. it's like i like to think about it that remember not remember but think of like the first ever human being to say i wonder what's on the other side of the valley or mountain curiosity you know what I mean? That's the first immigrant. That human being is the first immigrant. The one that thought like, oh, let's go over there. Maybe there's something better there. Or oh, I want to see what's on, uh, over there. Mm -hmm. I guess it's just oh. a part of our, I don't know, nature to be... To, yeah, to I mean, wander. there's Not some people that love... That, that's, there's some people that, we, that, like me or you, is like, I need to move. I want to move. I, I, you know. And then there's some people that like, I'm good here. I love it here. Like I have family members back home. They don't want to, they don't want to move. I'm like, why am I going to move? I have everything mm -hmm. here. <laughs> no, exactly. Even like going back to example that you gave earlier about your job, they were, you're lifting things up and lifting these speakers that you're like having a good life. And it was, was fun. And for some people, that lack of um, responsibility, that's what they are looking for. That's what they want. They don't want to go mm. higher in their career just because they don't want more responsibility. So people are different. Some people are want more responsibility and some people don't. And that's and the same thing for like immigration. It's just some, some people are happy where they are. Some people are not. Some people mm. are chasing something else. They don't even know what they're chasing, but they, they have to go to. They have to go and see what's out there. That's, I guess, the mm. what's different between uh, people that move abroad and people they don't. Yeah, I mean, some people are just content of what they are and what they have achieved. That doesn't mean they're you know, lower or lesser human beings than us or whatever. Absolutely. It's just, that's what they want. It, you know, they're satisfied. Mm -hmm. And some, you know, if you're satisfied, why, why look for something exactly. else, you know? And also like in other circumstances, like, like yours, some people no, don't move abroad just because they, like me, they want to see what's up out there. For you, just like, okay, 
I want, I have like, I don't want to starve. I have like a good <laughs> future for you, I guess from your, your parents. Like I want to give my children like a good future, which is yeah, means yeah. enormous, enormous circumstances that means a, a normal life, a good future for mm. you, for your friend, for your family, for other people that are born in Canada, that means like a normal life, nothing special, right? Nothing, no, mm, I don't want to yeah. give anything away from what your mom or just absolutely not, like it's been great. But just to put things in perspective, what they were looking for, for other people that are born in the country, it's just the norm. But for you, it just, yeah, that's, it, what it, I, that's what I love about perspective. Yeah, me too. I, that's why I love doing podcasting and just talking to people and just getting perspective from other people. Because, you know, you get into this mindset and you just think of this is the right thing to say or do. And then someone will say, oh, by the way, and you'll be like, whoa. Yeah. <laughs> And you mentioned your podcast multiple times. It's a, it's a mm -hmm. podcast called An, An Immigrant's Life. Just not to confound with immigrants, it's An Immigrant's Life. Do you want to tell the mm -hmm. listeners what, what do you do, what your podcast is about? Oh, hey, thank you. It's uh, An Immigrant's Life, a uh, storytelling podcast with immigrants or people that it's not even immigrants as long as they have relationship with immigration. But really, it's pretty much just me talking shit to other guests, you know, <laughs> it's not very like, not like Daniel's uh, podcast, but Daniel's podcast, you know, amazing and helpful. Mine is just like, Hey, let's talk about when one time you, you know, you got drunk. I don't know. You know, random stuff. We do talk. I do talk about immigration. It's like the core of the podcast, but really it's just like a very, it's a conversational, um, podcast um, I, I love doing it by the way thank you for mentioning it um yeah i've been doing it for a while now and i i love doing it i always had i remember the first time i heard about podcast it came from my friend george uh no not george greg shout out to my boy greg and he introduced it to me he said yo i said what is that he says oh it's podcast i'm like what's a podcast I'm like oh we just you know it's like radio but on the internet I'm like and I always remember this like thought in my mind a voice said like you can do podcasting and that this is like way way back like I'm gonna say I don't know maybe 2017 2016 something like that like before podcast was a, po was a podcast maybe more maybe longer and I, I don't know why, but I always knew like I'm going to do podcasting and, you know, fast forward, it took a pandemic for me to do, Same. to start uh, podcasting, you know, but I always say, because I given a thought about that is like, oh, why didn't you start it earlier or whatnot? But I'm like, because I wasn't ready and the, the technology wasn't ready. Yet. Like here, I won't be able to talk mm -hmm. to you back a few years exactly. ago. You know what I mean? So it won't be possible. And with our with our, I guess, audience, as you say, as you might say, is you need, you're not going to travel to BC to talk to Danielle. I mean, I love to shoot the shit with you, but you know what I mean? The, come on. You we know? can't afford doing That's that. One, <laughs> we'll be, we'll exactly, be awesome. You know? We'll be awesome to talk like in, in real <laughs> life in person, but we can't, we can't afford doing that. <laughs> exactly. You know, so yeah, so technology lined up and I was like, okay, I'm going to start now. I'm going to do it now. And yeah, I, till now, I still enjoy it. I continue it. I, I publish, publish. Uh, yeah, I guess publish. I publish an episode every week, every Tuesday. And uh, yeah, I mean, I love meeting people like Daniel. Like I would have never met you mm -hmm. if, if not for the podcast, you know, and I love when people reach out and say, hey, man, you inspire me. I'm like, yo, relax. Inspire me. Get out of here. Inspire it's, me. It's hard, it's me. hard to take it, in, take it in, right? It's hard. Like, you, I, don't, I don't know you, but even for me, like, it's even hard to thinking that somebody is actually listening to this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. like, I'm like, yo, I, 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 listen, if somebody listens, I'm grateful and I want them to listen, obviously, right? But when they reach out and they say, hey, you're doing a great job or um, you're inspiring, inspiring me, I'm like, yo, take it easy, dude. You, I'm, if you are looking up to me, 
you have issues because I'm not the person to look after, you know? Like, look for somewhere else. I love that you're listening, but not, you know I, dis- I, mean? I disagree. I disagree with, uh, <laughs> we said this before, like, you keep saying that you're not smart, that, like, you're doing things. I completely disagree with you. I think you're really smart. The work you do with the podcast is amazing. You say, like, you're just doing things, but I think you know what you're doing. And, like, people reach out to you because you're inspired. And I believe that. I believe that, like, through the things you do, the people that you bring to your show, you inspire people. You will help people, even though you don't think you do. But I have to say, I listen to your podcast. And I think I, if people reach out to you, that means it's true. And that they, if they look up to you, it's because you brought value to them. And I can mm-hmm. see that. I can see that. Thank you. I appreciate it. I mean, I do believe them. It's just, it's hard to yeah, believe. I get it that they're talking to me. I mean, I appreciate that you think I'm smart, but ask me one plus one, I'll be like 11. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's, uh, it's, but, it's thinking outside of the box. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But I, I don't know. It's just, I appreciate it. Like, like the, every time somebody reaches out, it's just like, bro, I'm so happy. It makes me so happy. It's like a drug, a good mm-hmm. drug, you know, like it makes, and obviously it's, this thing that we do is ebb and flow. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad. Sometimes you're like, why am I doing this? Yeah, What's the point? Exactly. And then you get a message like that and like, oh, this is why I'm doing mm-hmm. this. This is exactly why. The funny thing is sometimes though, they, I don't know if you ever get this, it's like they'll reach out to you like you're a, an immigration specialist. Mm, no, that's not my case. I can I figure probably people can no? get it. That I'm not a specialist uh, in immigration. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know why people sometimes think so that. I'm like, yo, well, help me immigrate. I'm like, bro, I don't even know how I got to Canada, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. And then I usually just like send them like, um, what is that? The government uh, mm-hmm. website, like CIG.ca, whatever. That or obviously through the podcast, I've met people that are working mm-hmm. for immigration and whatnot. And I'm like, hey, talk to these people. These guys are the smart people. If I, I don't know anything about the immigration. I know that people move. That's it, you know, for document wise or like uh, how to fill up things. I don't know. You're the best person, actually, Daniel, because um, you've done it. Actually, mm-hmm. I pretty much didn't do anything. It was my mom, my sister. I just signed papers. Yeah, but <laughs> even then, like even if you do that, like I me, mean, things change constantly. Change mm-hmm. constantly. Mm-hmm. It's a job. Like people like us, if you need to. It's, it's a job. It's a full-time job. So you need, if you know, if you want to know what's going on, you need to talk to professionals. Like if, even, even if I've done it like six months ago, by now everything would change, would be different. So mm-hmm. it's hard to, it's hard to be like, that's why I don't want to be part of immigration. Like it's something I hate doing it because I have to do it. Mm-hmm. But immigration is something I can't stand. The immigration process because you feel like an outsider. It reminds you that you oh. don't belong. It's just a, such a <laughs> wrong process. I, I wish the immigration process would be different, but it's not. It's not. Mm. So I hate doing that. I'm glad there's a professional out there that enjoying doing that because I hate mm. it. <laughs> just, yeah, it's, uh, phew, man. Are you a citizen now? Uh, not yet, um, but I'm a permanent resident. Okay, okay. Yeah. Which is, uh, I think I've been. It's a, it's a great thing. Mm. It's a, I mean, being a permanent resident is such a, relief because I was on a work visa for I mean I did five years in New Zealand two years for like I was six, six seven years on a um, no five six years on a on a work visa and you have to renew every single time you are oh restricted from the work you can do you don't have the freedom to change the job you, you are not the freedom to do whatever you are restricted with either with a company or with the profession mm-hmm. so if you want to change profession or change job it's not that easy so for me, having a permanent wow. residency, I can start a business right now. I can do whatever I want. I can change job tomorrow. I can do two jobs. I can do whatever I want. It's such a freedom of like, mm-hmm. for like, yeah, just a, it's a big relief. So congratulations. Because it's, uh, that's it's funny thing though. It's like, like what we thought we're talking about, like um, me growing up, it's like poverty, right? And then I came to Canada, everything was easy. Mm-hmm. Well, everything like easy. majority of the time it's easy because if I came here, I was PR, permanent resident automatic, mm-hmm. right? And then I I don't know if it has changed, but I think it's you have to stay three years in Canada yeah, same thing. to be right. And I passed that. I wasn't even applying for citizenship. I was like, ah, whatever, you know, I, mean, I, I don't need it. What's the point, mm-hmm. you know? 
And then I applied finally and then I was a citizen and I didn't even like pay attention to it. Like I remember when I got the paper, like, oh, you're going to be a citizen. You have to go to this place for the, what do you call this? Like a uh, notarization or something and, like that. Like, you know, when they have like a ceremony? Yeah, I think neutralization or yeah. something like that. Okay. So anyway, they just like, oh, come to this place. And it's, bro, when I came there, I felt like I was being bugged. I felt like I was being like, um, wa- I'm, I'm wasting my time. That's how I'm privileged I was. I was like, man, just give me the papers and leave me, leave me alone. I'm good, you know? And while that was happening inside my mind, my privileged mind, I was looking over and people were crying, like crying, crying. They were looking at me like, oh, congratulations, you know, like we finally made it. And I'm like, I'm, I'm good. Uh, you know, I was like, I'm cool, whatever, man. I, th- I didn't even do anything, mm-hmm. you know, because I came here PR compared to you. It's just like you have to go through these steps every year. Oh, my God. I would probably go home in, in the Philippines. <laughs> and another thing, having be a citizen, you got Canadian passport. It makes a huge difference when you travel. Dude, the most powerful document ever. Makes a huge... I have a friend that she's from Peru. And she said like when she travels through the US with a Peru, uh, Peruvian mm. passport, they, they mm. think the loops that she has to jump through because she has like a passport. She think, people think she's a drug dealer and all that things. Mm. And now she travels with a Canadian passport. It's so much easier. They don't stop her. They go through the custom and like with like two minutes, it's gone through the custom. It's so mm. much. It makes a huge difference for a spe- specific country, which might not be the case for me. As I said, a reminder, like I'm a privilege, I know. But for other countries, honestly, it can be like a huge difference. Mm-hmm. Yeah, dude, it's just like, you know, it's funny though. When I went to visit the Philippines a few years ago, mm-hmm. they look at me like, this guy, you're not citizen, you're Filipino still. <laughs> <laughs> and it's funny, before we came to the airport my, or leave Canada for to go to the Philippines for a visit, my sister says, oh, by the way, they're going to separate you. Uh, line right, uh, the line on the right will be like, I don't know, like citizen of whatever country. And then on the other, le- the left side will be like the Filipino side passport, you know? So like, okay, cool. I'm sure, you know, I'm Canadian, so I have special you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> privilege. We go in, dude, the line was like so long. And then we look over to the Filipino side. There's like nobody there. <laughs> I'm like, wait, I'm like, no, no, I'm Filipino. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it was just like, they were looking, they were looking at me like this guy, you're not, you're not Canadian, you're Filipino. That's actually, which I am Filipino, yeah. but I have the document, you know. <laughs> but it's actually interesting because I heard this multiple times with, from, from guests that when they move back home, people think like, oh, you're not from here. You're from the country you moved to. And the country you moved to, you're not really from mm. their country because you're still an immigrant. You're from another country. Mm. So they feel themselves, they found themselves like in this limbo there. They seem like they don't belong in either countries. But it seems like you were like, mm. <laughs> people think you're still Filipino. At least you belong oh, no, to no, a no, country. No. <laughs> No, no, I'm still, I'm still, I, I have that, I know that feeling. I, I'm not saying like I belong there. Like it, they just look at me like, yeah, you just have this paper, but you're still oh, Filipino okay. kind of deal. But socially, I call this, I call it the Bob Marley effect. Okay, explain Because Bob Marley is half black, half white. Okay. And growing up, he used to chill with the black people and the black people like, you're not black, you're white. And then, but he goes to the white side, they're like, uh, you're black, mm. so don't hang out with us. So that's like the immigrant. Like as we grew up in the Philippines, I grew up in the Philippines, or you grew up in Italy, you moved to Canada, you came here like, you're not really Canadian, you're Filipino or you're mm-hmm. Italian, right? But you go back to Italy, you're like, you're not Italian, you, you go back to Canada. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> you know I mean? You're like in the limbo. <laughs> and it was like, it was like that. The funny thing was, I didn't know about reverse culture shock back then. And this is real, reverse culture mm-hmm. shock. Because I came here, I had culture shock. I went back to the Philippines for a visit. There is reverse culture shock. Which is worse. There was a moment. Yes, because you thought you're good. You thought you're home. You thought you're comfortable. And then be like, oh, by the way, no, you're not even Italian or Filipino. You're like, you're Canadian now. And you're like, no, 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 no. We're still, I'm still with you guys. Like, no, no, no. You're somewhere else now. And it was just like, it was a weird feeling. 
And the feeling was, for me, it was the main thing was, I grew up here. I, I was these kids, these kids that like poor and running around without shoes or, or flip flops, you know, w- w- dirty and hungry. That's me. That's, that's me. But they, the way they look at me like, no, 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 you're not us. You're some, a different person now. And it's such a weird feeling. It's like, no, no, no. I am you guys. Like even with, with my friends, some of the people that stays back home, I felt like, there's a distance like that, like, oh, I remember this one one time I went out with my friends. We went drinking and they were just talking. And then I was like, you know what? In my mind, like, I stepped out, out of the conversation or the, the circle. And I was just, you know, looking at them and just studying them. And I was like, man, it, I came to the realization, like, these people lives move on without me. And now... They don't need me really mm-hmm. because they're okay. And it made me feel like out, an outsider in a group that I grew up with since I, we were young. And I have the feeling like, wow, I'm not in this group anymore. Mm-hmm. I'm outside now. But it, it it's fine. It's okay. You know, like it is what it is. I, it was nice to see them. But I had that feeling. I had that uh, realization. Have you had that when you visit uh, Italy? I'm lucky. No, I never felt that way. Maybe, maybe because I never mm. had the expectation of things. Because one of the biggest things about the reverse cultural shock, the expectation and thing still the same, but they don't. Like you said, it seems like you're going back. People have moved on. They have like a different uh, different life. They have different groups. Here. Mm. This is not the same as the time that you left. I never have that mm. expectation and I'm be. I, I am super lucky that every time I go back to Italy, all of my friends show up for me. Like, it doesn't matter if they have kids or the, every single time I go back, they show up for me. They all, we always have a party. We always hang out. We go mm. for dinner. They're always there for me. So I'm privileged, mm. super lucky that I still have the, those friends. I mean, I invest time and energy to keep the, like, this friendship and relationship alive. Mm. But man, like I don't take that for granted because I know other people that left Italy and moved abroad and they don't have the same kind of experience mm. when they come back. It's just, I don't know, probably because I invested that much time and every time I go back, I yeah. make sure that I invite everybody. I make a, like a, a big deal when I come back because mm-hmm. I don't know. I don't. No, no, you're right. That, that, that's, that's important, that connection. However, I did try to make this connection, but... It was like, you know, people have lives mm-hmm. or, you know, kids or career or whatever. So the connection is not as strong. And you are absolutely correct. It's like you invest time and you make time to have connection with these people. But with me, like some of them, yes, I still do have the connection. But with I'm talking about the people that I didn't have connections with. Those are the people that it just like I felt like I was an outsider. Mm-hmm. <coughs> but yeah. Expect, but going back to you said expectation. Um, no, I didn't have expectation that like it, things are the same. I knew it, it's not going to be the same. But for me, it was just like, oh, they're having conversation. They don't need me mm-hmm. here. They still have this conversation. Um, yeah. So they just like, I know also they have references that I don't understand mm-hmm. anymore because it's like a cultural a thing. thing. Yeah, exactly. So, but again, it was nice to see them after like, I don't know, like 15 years. Oh, wow. Yeah, it's a big diff- I mean, I don't, I usually <laughs> go back. I mean, I mean, I think this time, like after COVID is the longest one, which is almost three years. That's the longest one. Mm. But usually I go back every year, year and a half. So there's a short amount okay. of time. And also like with FaceTime and all of that things, we keep in touch and we kind of like, a, I don't know, update each other. So we know, we know mm. what's going on with our life. So I feel more part of the conversation, even though another maybe problem I don't know if it, this is part of the cultural shock but for me is the fact that mm-hmm. I don't feel as connected as before just because the experience that I lived are different from from them so the thing I've been mm-hmm. through my experience and my problem air quote probably because no, they're not really a problem but they're not they're different from from them they don't get it mm-hmm. so I feel like this this connection between my life and theirs so it's hard having to like it's hard to have deep conversation about life because we we are completely on a different level. Hmm. Yeah. 
I understand that because I do have conversation with some people that immigrated and they're doing okay. And then the people that still back home, it's, it's kind of hard, you know, like I'm complaining about, I don't know, my Wi-Fi connection and he's complaining about, you know, if his kids are going to go to school next year, because can he afford it? You know what I mean? Yeah. I completely agree. Totally. And I'd like to close this interview and I really have to thank you for the time that you're taking for, for to sharing your amazing story. But before mm-hmm. we wrap mm-hmm. this up, do you have, do you have any advice for the, for the people that, for the listeners that maybe wants to move abroad or they're thinking of moving abroad, or maybe specific to Canada? No, it could be anything. It could be mm-hmm. specific to Canada or just in general, people that wants to move abroad. Yeah, sure. I prepared this because I'm not good at this inspirational or like smart things to say. <laughs> <laughs> But so I got three things for future immigrants or people that want to move. The main thing is learn the language of the country to which you are moving to. This is integral because you cannot make a connection. You cannot get a job if you don't understand them or they don't understand you. It's so important. And practice before you move. You got to practice before you move. People will laugh at you. People make fun of you for speaking a different language. Screw them. They're not going to pay your bills. Second will be make connections. Family, friends, organization to the country that you are moving to. Even before you arrive, make connections, especially now, social media. It's like powerful for these things, right? Because once you arrive, especially like I'm sure you're like your situation, Danielle, we were talking about earlier, like making friends. Holy crap. It's the most, it's the like the least thing to talk about that people talk about. But the main thing that kind of like drags you down is not having friends, not having that social um, connection that like no one knows you. No one cares about you when you move to a different country because no one understands mm-hmm. you, right? So try to make, if you have friends or family that are already in that country, make connection. And if not, just make meet organizations or people, especially local people, because those are the people that understand the culture more than, you know, other people. Immigrants helps, obviously, because they know, you know, some of them, they know the, the, the hoops that you have to go through, but it's good if you have a local friend you know what i mean and lastly i guess this is like a three-parter but for me it's one be brave be patient and enjoy the ride because it's pretty awesome oh I, uh, yeah absolutely you i agree with everything you said i think you like a clear a point like the three main thing about moving abroad absolutely i want mm-hmm. to add one thing about finding friends and the The importance of why making friends is so important when you move abroad is because you don't feel at home until you have a circle mm-hmm. of people around you, a circle of friends. You can be in the most beautiful place on earth and you won't feel home until you have a circle of friends. So that's why it's so important mm-hmm. to making friends uh, when, you, when you come abroad, yeah. when you go abroad. And also the, the importance to make people locally And if you make friends with immigrants, there's a good chance they won't stick around as long because people might not be able to stay in the country. Maybe they want to move somewhere else to try something else because when you're an immigrant, there's less, you don't have roots anymore. So you can either be in this country, you can go somewhere else, you come back home. So it's harder. You might lose some of the friends. So it's, and it's hard because they already make your, it mm-hmm. takes effort to create some relationship, some friendship. I mm-hmm. want those to last. So that's why another important thing about making friends of a local, a local community or for like locally from the same country. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree with that. It's, they, some people do move. They're like, one minute, you're friends. And then, by the way, I'm moving yeah. now. <laughs> like, what? You're my only friend. And that goes vice versa. That can, you can be that person that then leaves. And that sucks. Oh, I'm not moving. I'm, yeah, no, I'm, <laughs> I'm talking about in general. Like if, because when you do it once, know, know. like at least in my experience, when you do it once, you start wondering like, what if I should, I should probably try something else. Maybe I, I'm, I'm great, happy mm. here, but maybe who knows? Maybe there's something better out there. It still has that, at least for yeah. me, that's still in the back of my mind. Like what if, if the country maybe is better? It still has like the wonder if there's anything better or something different. Yeah, I mean, 
for sure if you again if you're in a good position and you're you don't have kids or family in that country you you're pretty much like hey dude I'm you know what today I'm moving to Iceland or Norway you know yeah it goes back to the fact that some people moving abroad is not for everybody <laughs> that's that's mm. that's back it's back then like moving abroad is not yeah. for everybody no, I, I completely agree. I remember I met someone here. Uh, he was an engineer back in the Philippines. And it's like, like well, at least what he told me, uh, that he was a like high-level engineer. He has like people mm-hmm. with him uh, that he like, yeah, I guess he's the boss, you know. And he was just a busboy here in Canada. You know, he was just cleaning the tables and whatnot. And I used to talk to him like, yo, you know, because I can tell he's, he's homesick. Mm-hmm. And he told me the story, like, oh, I moved here in Canada. I thought life is going to be better. But man, I'm doing this. Back home, I was an uh, engineer. You know, I was, I have like people under me. I'm like, okay, well, you know, guess what? It's Canada. You know, it is what it is. You start zero. That's why you immigrate. But that's not just Canada. And that's you, any country. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you're right. You're right. If you immigrate. Uh, yeah, like in a few weeks, he went back home to the Philippines because mm-hmm. he couldn't handle it. He's like... I don't know if it's ego or whatever else. Like he just, I cannot clean tables. I, back home, I'm an engineer and I'm a boss. I want to choose that, you know? No, I, I can totally can see that. that. There's, the reality is there's so many people, doctors or engineers, as you said, they, they drive mm. taxis or they do like a, like a low income, low pay job just because their qualification is not recognized in the country they move to. And they have to mm-hmm. go through mm-hmm. the ladder all over again. And maybe they have family now. They can't afford to go to school. They just, they, it's it's hard, man. It's hard. Mm-hmm. It is. If, I know. It's like, it's incredibly difficult, especially if you have family to feed, you know, it's it's hard. So be like Daniel. If you want inspiration, <laughs> go talk to Daniel. He, he He's good. He, he got things to say to you, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Let's close this on a positive, uh, a positive note. Yeah. If just, if you get, if you need some motivation, like <laughs> listen to some podcasts like mine or Aaron's, even his podcast, like mm. an immigrant's life. Just listen to mm. it. It's, it's an amazing podcast. It's going to find other inspiring story of people that have moved abroad or they related with immigration. Uh, if people wants to get in touch with you or relate with your story where people can find you. Yeah. Uh, I'm on all the social media except for Twitter. I'm not cool enough. <laughs> it's at an immigrant's life. Um, you can listen to the podcast wherever, however you listen to the podcast on Immigrants Live. Yeah, it's every Tuesday. If you also, if you want to, you know, you just want to talk shit. If you want to come on to be a guest, hey, let me know. We'll talk. <laughs> Sweet. And as usual, all the links will be in the show notes for people to reach out to you like more easily. Sweet, Aaron, I really appreciate your time and uh, sharing your story on my my podcast. Really, thank you. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Appreciate it too. Thank you so much. Bye. Yes, sir. Bye.